The View Screen is your weekly Star Trek magazine program streaming live on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. We've got lots of news, features, and lots of love for our chosen Star Trek family all across the globe. So this week is our bonus episode of season one, and we're in collaboration with Strange New Pod for the last days of Disco Festival. Now, if you're not able to tune in live, don't worry, we got you covered. Uh, we have this as an audio on a podcast. So go ahead, search for the view screen on any podcast platform, and you'll find us there. We really appreciate all of your support. So we would like to remind you of the 287th rule of acquisition, subscribers equals profit. So please remember to hit that like and subscribe button. Uh, make sure you never miss an episode. We do have a goal of getting to 100 subscribers by the end of this episode, would you believe? <laughs> so right now, we've got around 80. So if you're on episode and you're watching us, please do subscribe. Let's, uh, let's hit that milestone goal together. So, Calvin, my dear, we are bonus episode 11. How are you doing I this know. week? That we are the show that just won't go away. <laughs> <laughs> This is our encore episode, if you will, although I'm not oh. sure I should be speaking French, given uh, all of the French oh bashing that has goodness. been going on over Prodigy this weekend. I just, what happened? I mean, literally, what happened? Did they think that they had permission? Did Probably. someone literally leak it? This Heads are going to roll. Yeah, yeah. Well, tomorrow they will. Nobody works over the weekend in Europe. Oh. <laughs> right well as you may guess by amy's t-shirt my uniform we would like to dedicate this show to star trek discovery and we do have a special lineup coming to you featuring hosts from all across the bqn podcast network so what have we got then today we have we have a cooking demonstration with Matthew Dempsey from The Food Replicator. Hey, Matt. Hi. Uh, because there's been so many <laughs> captains of Discovery, we're bringing in Captain Jeremiah of Captain's Couch. Hey. And because Discovery is so well produced and cinematic, we've got Matt Jennings from Cinema Z joining us today. Hey, Matt. Well, another packed show for our swan song. So let's yes. get to it. All right. Hey, Matt. Right. We may Hi. have noticed Amy's just uh, jumped off stage. So I wonder where Amy she may be going. In. Any ideas? Hey! hey. <laughs> All right. So this week we are cooking out of, oops, as I just closed the page to what I needed to be on, uh, the Star Trek cookbook, the newest one that was published just a couple of years ago. Oh, uh, where's the page I need? Here we go. Um, so to be honest, there aren't a lot of discovery recipes in the book. Um, because it was published, you know, I think what, what's the copyright date here? 2022, 21, something like that. And of course, books are written in advance. So there hadn't been that many seasons of Discovery when the author was testing, but we're doing crotta leg skewers uh, for this particular episode. Uh, I've got a brief little slideshow to talk about crotta leg. If we could get that up on screen. And uh, crotta legs. We go to the next slide. We're first mentioned in DS9. We can see Kira and Odo talking about it. Then there was a fun Easter egg in Lower Decks, uh, Mr. Crotta Leg, uh, the stand there. And then you can flip to the next slide for me. And I love this so much. Uh, so this comes from 2017, the first season of Disco, uh, where Mary Chifo's character, Laurel, is eating a chicken drumstick as the one person tweeting says. And she writes, she writes back, no, it's a Crotta Leg. So there we go. That's how it ties into Star Trek Discovery. So these are essentially going to be meatballs uh, that have a sauce component and, of course, the meatball component. I've already made the sauce ahead of time because this is live TV, but I will talk about what goes into it. So the sauce will have some garlic cloves, which these are pre-peeled because I'm lazy. Then it's going to have a little bit of soy sauce, molasses, 
tahini, which is a sesame seed paste. Uh, very good stuff. I love tahini. Rice vinegar. A little bit of vegetable oil. You could use avocado oil, really any oil. This is just what I had on hand. A little bit of sriracha for some heat. One of my favorite spices, smoked paprika. Very good. Mm -hmm. And then just salt and pepper. And you basically blitz it in a blender, and it makes the sauce. Sauces are not very exciting to look at in a container, but that's already done. So what I'm doing in the first segment here, then, is making the meat mixture itself. So I got to grab the turkey because I did not have that ready to go. Thank you. Oh, I got my sous chef, Amy, here. <laughs> And this is going to come together really quickly. Just a few things go in here, but there are some good techniques that you're going to want to know. So firstly, you're going to grab yourself the bowl. And you're going to dump the turkey in the bowl. And then your sous chef will throw away the package. <laughs> then uh, the interesting part of this recipe, I think. So we're going to use a food processor. I have a mini one here. If you have a, just a regular blender or like a ninja or something, that will work. We are going to throw an egg into the food processor. No raw eggs this time, Kelvin, so you don't have to worry about our safety. Oh, I was waiting for you to wash your hands after handling the raw chicken, but never mind. It's all going in the same thing. Don't worry about it. I'll be touching it and massaging my meat here in just a moment, so stay tuned, viewers. <laughs> Ooh, can't wait and for that. that the really interesting ingredient is anchovies. So on my show, The Food Replicator, I normally try recipes as printed. I don't change a thing. But I recipe tested this last night to make sure I knew what I was doing. And it called for two ounces of anchovies. And I like anchovies. Anchovies are in a lot of dishes. Caesar salad dressing, for example, classically has anchovies, but you can't taste it. You could taste it in this. And I it, again, calls for two ounces. Last night, I only did one. I'm going to cut it back even more. Uh, it was a little bit fishy. So if you can eyeball it, great. I'm going to do about half an ounce. Uh, but if you don't, I think a kitchen scale is one of the best tools you can have in the kitchen. I'm just going to measure it out because I don't want it to be too much. And actually, I don't have that much left in the jar based on my recipe testing. This is just anchovies in olive oil. I only have 0.4 anchovies, ounces, honestly. Do they dissolve into it or are they still quite solid? Yes. So what's going to happen is the egg is in here. We're going to dump the anchovies in, and we're going to blitz it. Ah. So apologies in advance, viewers. This is going to be a little loud, but we're just going to blitz it up. So essentially what I'm looking for here is that the anchovy has essentially disintegrated. There's still a few chunks. I'm going to blitz it a few more times. That's good enough for live TV. Yeah. So uh, we're going to take that. This is why I didn't care about washing my hands, because we're just going to dump it right in. This is right on top of the turkey. So that is good to go. Then I am still not going to wash my hands because i got to massage the meat. We're going to add a little bit of salt, just half a, half a teaspoon here. I always use kosher salt. It's, it's larger grain, so things won't be as salty. We're going to do... Uh, let's I'm so glad you just explained what salt? kosher salt is, Matt, because we don't call it that in the UK, so we would call really? it... What do you salt? call it? No, we oh, would well, call it maybe rock, rock salt or sea salt. Oh, interesting. I Well, I don't know. Uh, here in the US, sea salt is different from kosher salt because kosher salt is not from the sea. Um, I'm not exactly sure why it's called kosher. I'm not sure if it has something to do with uh, uh, it being made kosher by like a rabbi or something. <laughs> but the reason cooks in the U.S. tend to prefer it is the, I can't really demonstrate, the granules are pretty big, whereas table salt, they're very small. Oh, so yeah. half a teaspoon of table salt will be way saltier than half a teaspoon of kosher. Ah, so, interesting. Yeah, so it just makes things less salty. Uh, one teaspoon of that sauce that I pre-made, of all those ingredients we talked about, just stirring to reincorporate. We got that. 
And then most meatball recipes, whether it's a beef meatball, a lamb meatball, in this case, turkey, is going to use panko breadcrumbs. This helps it bind together, keeps it a little bit lighter, because if it was just meat, it'd be super dense. Don't want that. And I prefer panko over breadcrumbs. Right. It has to be panko, almost for the same reason as kosher versus table salt. Yeah. Here in the States, if you buy breadcrumbs, it's basically sand paper, or not sand, what's it called? Like sand. Oh, no. like sand. Yeah. 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 But panko, again, you probably can't really see, but it's, it's uh, can you see that? Probably not. It's pretty big compared to yeah. like a dust. Dust is the word dust. I was looking for. Yeah. And then meatballs always mix with your hands. The key though is not to overmix. I want to get it incorporated, get those breadcrumbs throughout. But if you overmix, you're going to have dense, gluey, gummy meatballs. Nobody wants that. So I'm just going to do this for a couple of seconds. And then I'm going to look to, so you won't probably be able to see it on the screen, but I can sort of see a little bit of the anchovy mixture because it's got the brown color. Uh, but I'm going to just make sure I don't see any streaks of brown to make sure the anchovy is well incorporated, that the breadcrumbs are evenly distributed. And that's it. I don't want to mix it more than that because they're going to get gummy. Then it sits in the fridge for 30 minutes to sort of firm up so I can shave it into meatballs. And that's it for the first part. Wonderful. Thank you, Matthew. I do feel yeah. like Amy should have been cleaning up or something around you there. She, well, come on, she Amy. Was. Pull your she weight. Was. She's a great sous chef, although I know we're not supposed to be speaking French, but <laughs> she's a great sous chef. So there we go. So we'll let this frame up for 30 minutes. We'll come back and I'll actually form them into balls. Wonderful. That's great. Amy, get yourself back to the studio right. and we shall yeah. carry on. Thank you, we look forward to seeing how that turns out a little bit later. Right. Okay. So why Amy uh, makes the mad dash across her house, it's several acres uh, wide. Let's welcome Captain Jeremiah from the Captain's Couch to the view screen. Uh, welcome to the view screen, my friend. Yes. Thank you, Kelvin. Thank you, Amy. It's good to see you again. It feels like we were just in the same room and now we've been separated by time and distance once more. Yeah. Absolutely. But we shall be together again very, very soon, I'm sure. How are things very, with very you? Soon. How's everything going? Uh, that's a loaded question, my friend. Uh, let's just say I have entered my uh, season five Janeway opener phase where I am locked in my quarters, blaming myself for mm. every decision that has ever been made in my life and torturing myself over all of those decisions. Oh, dear. Well, hmm. the stars will shine again very soon as you went as you get out of the void. That whatever which one you're in, my friend. Let's so hope that that's, us, we find that way out. So tell us about your show, uh, Captain's Couch. Well, the Captain's Couch was is a Star uh, Trek Voyager podcast. Uh, initially, it was going to go through each episode in chronological order. However, on this in seems indefinite hiatus, I have decided to reformat a little bit. And when I eventually return, it will be more of a broader discussion of Voyager subjects rather than an episode recap. So oh. I'm looking at, will we will be talking about races, specifically Vidians, Kazon, Herosian, um, Voyager technology themes, Voyager morality themes, um, subjects along those lines to make it a little diverse in this wild landscape of podcasts where there are so many episode rewatch shows. Interesting. Can't wait for that. So, uh, yeah, I hope you're not scrapping season two that you've got in the can because that's the episode I'm on. <laughs> no, I, your episode still will be featured. It will be a little bit of uh, the three episodes that were recorded prior to my uh, mental breakdown. Um, they'll still be they'll still be aired. They'll just seem a little temporarily displaced with some <laughs> of the things that we talked about and some of the topics that were going on in that time. But no, they'll definitely be salvaged. I wonder how well they age. But in the meantime, <laughs> why don't you uh, sh let's get on with what you're here to show us today? What, what are we? Well, we at? are the of we are here to discuss the mini captains of the USS Discovery. And I did the math the other day, and it seems like in Discovery's not even five seasons, we have had more captains of this starship than we have seen in any previous iteration of Trek. Yeah, they're. It's a revolving door of captains, which honestly has made the show quite interesting from my perspective. Yeah. I agree. Um, Sometimes do it once. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so let's bring those captains up. 
So our very first captain, of course, is Gabriel Lorca, who we found out very quickly was not such a great guy as he was the mirror version of Lorca that had crossed over into the Prime Universe masquerading with his ultimate goal of using the Discovery to overthrow the Terran Empire, Giorgio. Mm -hmm. I have never quite decided if I would like to know about Prime Lorca or not, or to find out his true fate. I, I think it's quite interesting to leave the character as we know him. Oh, Don't you think it's interesting, though, that when season one finished and there was all the hashtags of find Prime Lorca and everyone was up in arms, as soon as our, what I imagine, next slide is, everybody just got over it and was obsessing over Ransom Mount. <laughs> We're fickle. We are fickle. Um, let's see that next slide, because I'll tell you the truth, I can't remember who's next up. Oh, that's right. Ooh. It is Mr. Saru. Because we know that Saru obviously was Lorca's first officer, and once Lorca disappeared, or was killed, actually, that Saru took command Damn. of the starship. And Saru, honestly, is one of my absolute favorite characters of Discovery. He is going to be the one I miss the most, not only because Doug himself is a terrific human being, but Saru is just such a fascinating character, a race we've never seen before. We're learning everything about the Kelpians through his eyes. Um, we're also seeing two completely different versions of Starfleet through his eyes, mm -hmm. as well as rediscovering Vulcan in their current time setting through a completely alien character, which is something I've been wanting from Trek for a long time of, let's move away from Starfleet and the Federation. Let's see this vast universe from another culture's perspective. Let's have Star Trek Kronos. Let's have Star Trek Cardassia. Let's see the inner political workings of these races and view the Federation and Starfleet from their eyes and not have, not see the Federation as we've always seen it. Let's see it from the other side of the quadrant. Right. Mm. Was the Delta Quadrant not far enough away for you? <laughs> oh, no, no. The Delta Quadrant, you know. It's my happy place. Let's not mess with it yet. <laughs> you know, one thing I really liked about Captain Saru was, you know, he was preparing and trying to be his best. And so he self analyzes and self reflects, you know, especially when he's like, well, what makes good captains? And, you know, we have that famous scene where they pull up and there's Jonathan Archer. And, you know, so he's looking at what qualities make a good leader. And I think self-reflection is just so important in any role, uh, responsibility, leadership role like that. So I really like that with Saru. Uh, I, I love that too. And I, especially because I can relate to his self-doubt and him wanting to abdicate those responsibilities, but also wanting to keep the center chair. It's very much a conflict I am very familiar with. Let's see who we have up next. So I put these a little out of order when I was reordering this morning because I wasn't awake. If we do in chronological order, Till Killy, as she is known, would actually come between Lorca and Saru. As once mm -hmm. Discovery crossed into the Mirror Universe, we find out that there, Tilly is actually a insane homicidal dominatrix who is the captain of Discovery. Not only do I love Tilly, Again, one of my top favorite characters. I'll just get it out there. It's Tilly, Saru, and Burnham are my favorite Discovery characters. Um, and I, I loved seeing her in the center chair, it's especially as this version of herself. Very much reminiscent of Intendant Kira and Evil Janeway. And, or Living Witness Janeway, I should say. And I thought that Mary was absolutely brilliant in this role. And it was very, very interesting to see this take on the character, probably the most evil counterpart in the medieval, in the mirror universe that we have ever seen before. Mm. I mean, Tilly I enjoyed, was evil. I enjoyed the authentic Captain Killy that you got in Terra Firma later on in yeah. the series, because at the beginning it was our Tilly yeah. pretending Masquerading. to be. And, and it yeah. was the yeah. comedy aspect of pretending to be a badass and being really nervous about it. So I love that. 
Yes, I did too. And I, she just, she's wild. You, I both fear her and love her, which I think is <laughs> absolutely a dangerous combination. <laughs> right. But I, I think from a production standpoint, that was the entire goal for that character is to both love and fear her, which mm -hmm. I, I think in that universe you would need in that position, you need to be both loved and feared. Yeah. So let's see who we have up next in the center seat. Here we have Real Tilly. Again, I was not awake when I put these in order this morning, so I don't know how I messed that up. Um, but we also see the real Sylvia Tilly in command of Discovery once um, during the culmination of the burn against Osiris' ship. And Tilly, you know, we've known through the entire series that she wanted the command track, that that was the goal that she wanted. This, those circumstances have led to her questioning that decision, as we know it didn't go that well for her. But as Picard said, you can commit no mistakes and still fail. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what happened to her. She did nothing mm -hmm. wrong and still failed. But at the end of the day, her command decisions let helped lead to the success and rescue of Discovery's mission. She was able to save the ship, help save the crew. It didn't turn out the way that she wanted it, but it, I think it was a good experience for her for a future command of her own. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't see it as a, a failure. I find it interesting that someone who was so driven on a particular course to get somewhere and was such a high achiever that she got there so quickly to then decide, well, maybe that's not for me. I think is a story that we've not seen in Star Trek before. You've just had the, you know, the Rikers, the Kirks, so I want to be captain by 30. And to see someone who actually achieves and then questions themselves and has to pivot, I thought that was really fascinating with Tilly. I, I do too. I think the only other instance we would have seen something like that would be Harry Kim in the episode with the sentient warhead where he was in command yeah. of the night shift. They ran across that warhead. He made mm. the decision to bring it aboard Voyager, and it didn't go well for him. Um, no, Not to sh shoot uh, torpedoes at Harry, but that was really the only instance where we saw him actually working for that and not just being sad that he wasn't given a promotion just because he wanted a promotion. I think yeah. Tilly actually earned her opportunities, and we saw that play out in her arc where we haven't seen that in others. Interesting. Yeah. Up, up next for command, we have oh. Philippa Georgiou. Prime. But we have Mirror Georgiou masquerading as mm -hmm. Prime Georgiou. Yeah. Is at this time, Georgiou was never the captain of Discovery. She was, you know, long digested by those Klingons by the time Mirror Georgiou takes command of Prime Discovery. You know, I would have watched a Star Trek show just based off of the first episode of Discovery on the Shinzo with Giorgio in command. Uh, I, I like Michelle Yeoh quite a bit. I liked the character of Giorgio. I love the emperor of her. So to see her in this capacity where once again, she's kind of the center character for that episode. And she's in a way playing both versions of herself is fascinating i love an actor that can go back and forth between the two you know kira did it very well when she played both regular kira and intendant kira i think Giorgio was a great legacy to add to that kind of duality of characters um also just fascinating presence on the bridge and would love to see more of it thoughts I love, yes, Michelle Yeoh. And I'm in my rewatch and just seeing her on every time she's on screen, it's like you're you gravitate towards her. And I really liked seeing her, the mirror pretending to be prime. I thought that was so good and so well played. It I just I just loved it. And you're right. I am so looking forward to section 31, you know, movie with her. Yeah. You know, in a perfect universe, we could have all things that we would want. And one of the things I would love to see is the great women leaders of Star Trek together, which would be just a total temporal paradox, right? To have them all 
have number one, have Janeway, Kira, Giorgio, Burnham, have them all together. But just imagine what that would be like to have that group of individuals together to crack a problem and fix something. Mm -hmm. Would it be too many cooks in the kitchen or would it be a powerhouse of solutions? I'm going to go for the latter. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do think that Giorgio created a little bit of a problem for Star Trek in itself, though, of the morality of Star Trek to have an, let's face it, an evil character becoming such a fan favorite that with no kind of comeuppance of being a mass murderer, hating the ideals of the Federation. And to now actually having been the star of her own movie, you know, it is a very strange concept to have the baddie as the, the central character. So, you know, I, I agree with you, but at the same time, the non Trek portion of my soul has always rooted for the bad guys to win. So actually getting to see the bad guy win for once and get away with everything is quite satisfying to me. Because in every piece of media that I've ever seen, I tend to always want, like, let's see the bad guy win. I want to see what happens when the bad person wins. <laughs> but isn't it a true Trek philosophy of having her improve and be better than she was? And really, at the end, before she's going into the Guardian, like, Burnham believes that she can be better, that she's not going to get into trouble you know, and she's like, are you going to be checking up on me? And she's like, you shouldn't be doing anything that I need to check up on you. Right. Putting it back on this, you know, yourself. Um, so I really like that philosophy being applied to her. Oh, you're yeah. absolutely right, Amy. I mean, she what the character did change by the time she walked through the Guardian. And we, we saw that as she was returned to her original universe and discovered that she no longer fit in there. That right. why she still shared a lot of those traits. She was no longer the emperor. She no longer had it within herself to rule that empire in the manner that she had in the past. And had she stayed, it would have been her undoing because she would have been eaten alive. Literally. I mean, to change what this mirror universe, like you are bad. No, you can change yourself to be better. Like what better Trek ideal than that like i love it very much so well who has the con next kelvin oh here she is uh, admiral admiral cornwell, Tr admiral cornwell I my favorite that my favorite admiral that was not janeway um let's face it nobody will ever take that spot but admiral cornwell what an amazing character portrayed by an amazing actress. I love Jane Brooke and I, I love I love this admiral. Um I, I thought she was cut from the same cloth as the great ladies of Trek. Very much of the same caliber. Uh I love the fact that she had a background other than command but had been elevated to this position of an admiral in Starfleet. Um mm -hmm. the fact that she we have an admiral that wasn't a bad admiral was also yeah amazing for a, change. Because, yeah. for a change because let's face it most of the admirals are bad admirals even admiral ross from discovery if you read any of the books um the pre card books he turns out to be a bad admiral um so it's it was just nice to have a good admiral from from the get-go that actually was there to do the right thing and not for her own agenda and sadly ended up sacrificing herself in the end which great episode but why did we have to kill her come on i'm no. still holding with the theory that laurel beams her aboard her ship just as the explosion happens and she's going to pop up in strange new world season three at some point oh, that we, that would be amazing yeah we need but, we need that to happen <laughs> yeah putting it out there. Uh, I, I just, I loved the way, like, I thought it was amazing when she took command of Discovery. One of the things we've never seen before is that there's this secret override protocol that an admiral can just beam aboard a ship and completely shut it down and rescind all 
command authorization or any access to any system from the entire crew. Like, where has that been hiding the last 60 years in Star Trek? That was <laughs> fascinating. Thank Very God that was facing TNG. Think of all them admirals that came on the Enterprise <laughs> and Picard had to remind them that it was his ship, not the yes. fleet. <laughs> If Captain maybe, Admiral Bretman had one of those, it would have been a different episode. You know, maybe the removal of control also negated that command ability within a starship. Maybe that was yeah. some functionality of the control system. I don't know. We can speculate all day long. But unfortunately, we didn't get to know Katrina very well uh, or for very long, but her presence was a memorable one. But let's move on to our next commanding officer of Discovery. And now we have everybody's favorite, Captain Christopher Pike by the incredible Anson Mount. What a surprise twist this was. Who would have ever thought that we would have seen Pike show up of all characters in Discovery, and it would lead to an entirely new season because we demanded it. <laughs> mm -hmm. It really does show the, the, the power of the fandom. And the fact that we commanded this to happen, um, it's just unbelievable. And we were, you know, we're trying to do it again with Star Trek Legacy. Uh, no. Well, you know, we, we, we've succeeded so far. <laughs> we've succeeded several times with fan demands over the last six decades. Mm. You know, we demanded, I don't, I don't know, we say, I say we, we, we didn't exist in the beginning, um, but we as a collective saved the show. From its in its second season, mm -hmm. we our voices were collectively heard, and we got strange new worlds. Our voices were heard again, and we saved Prodigy at least yeah. in order to get a second season out of it. Mm -hmm. And of course, now we are screaming at the bit to have legacy. And while our demands have not yet been met, our voices are not quiet. So, community, mm -hmm. let's let's make this uh let's get hit this again and succeed. Yeah. You know. We, we have a good history of getting what we want out of the powers that be from Star Trek, but we need to be persistent and let them know resistance is futile. Mm -hmm. Anyway, back to Captain Pike, and uh, or as a couple of my friends like to refer to him, Daddy Pike. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What a great addition to Discovery. Uh, what a way to really turn the tables on the show and reinvent it in the second season, which I don't think hurt anything that was established at all. I think it just enhanced it and made it that much more interesting. Adding adding Pike and adding Spock and throwing sprinkling in a little number one there. I thought I think Anson brings a great deal to that original character that was never even supposed to be seen by us in that unaired pilot, but yet was released what in the 80s when they finally restored it and released it, Roddenberry did. When mm -hmm. we got to see the cage for the first time and Pike was solidified yeah, out, in out canon. Outside of the menagerie kind of clips. Yes. Yeah, it's a standalone yeah. in its own right. Yeah. So yeah, uh what a what a great way to build off of a, a actually Star Trek's original character and original captain. Exactly. And get, to, and get to know him. And I think Anson has brought a mm -hmm. tremendous amount to that character and made him his own. And I kind of forget about Jeffrey Hunter. And what Bruce Greenwood in the reboots, it's like, yeah, Anson is Pike. This is yeah. the Pike that we deserve. And this is the Pike that we need. And he piloted Discovery through one of its most treacherous sagas. I lost my train of thought. I'm very sorry, because I know this is live. And with Pike, you know, comes, uh, he brought a great deal of change to Discovery's crew and the way that it worked and some of the dynamic there between Burnham and Saru, which ultimately I think he helped make them stronger within their own relationships with one another. And let's see who took the helm after Mr. Pike did. Here she is. I Saru was in there in between because we know once they crossed into the Red Angel wormhole, Saru had command of Discovery. Um, he made he fired Burnham as his number one. Once they got back together, she's had a very rough, rough trek to this center seat here. Um, and again, Sylvia took command in between that, and then eventually 
ended up where the character was supposed to be from the get-go. As we know, or most of us know now, the entire premise of Discovery was always the journey to the chair for Burnham. It was the show, she was the central character, not as the captain. And we were, the purpose of it was, was to see her journey through her career to getting to that center seat finally. She had it, she lost it, she had it again. Very fascinating to see a lead character fail and succeed and fail and succeed, but ultimately to get where they know that they belong. And hopefully, collectively, we know that she belongs there as well. And we here we are going into season five, and I hope that we see her retain the center seat through the very end in that she is not displaced somewhere in the middle. I, I hope that they don't do that to us. Uh, but I think that she absolutely deserves the chair. And it, it's great to see another strong female character in command of a Star Trek show. Because we've absolutely. only had it once. And she had some very, very big shoes to fill. But I mm -hmm. think that she's doing a very great job of it. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, let's bring in the rest of the panel as well and just reflect on that incredibly long list longer than i thought it would be list of captains well done jeremiah you really really Thank you. managed to be a so so comprehensive with that um matthew starting with you um any thoughts on the lineup there any outstanding moments you want to comment on <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, the, firstly, the my great overview. I loved all the pictures you selected, but I do want to promise the viewers that there is no Captain Giorgio in my Klingon Prada leg meatballs. It's Giorgio free. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I was thinking, you know, I think Tilly to some degree mirrors Wesley's journey in TNG, where he decides hmm. that Starfleet's not for him. So he's different in that he leaves Starfleet, but he does decide, hey, my dad's path is, and my mom's path and Picard's path is not my own. But she does it in a slightly different way. So I thought that was such a good point that I've never quite thought of. And I think it is interesting and still unique for Star Trek. It's still just add in Wesley, you know. And so that's such a cool way to think of her character, I think, that I've, that's never occurred to me. Interesting. And what about yourself, Matt? Uh, you know, something that I, I've thought about as I've gone back, because I've been trying to go back here and there and watch a little bit of Discovery before we get into season five. And, you know... Um, it, it is very interesting. You know, we know it, this, the journey, you know, we get to see the journey from her being, uh, I guess what second in command of the Shenzhou to becoming the captain of discovery. And that how of all of that is very interesting to watch. It's also very interesting to me when I think about it and I think about captain Kirk and the, the Kirk isms, the, uh, the jumping into action, the shoot first, and take questions later. Um, there is a little bit, maybe a lot of bit of that in Michael Burnham mm -hmm. that I've kind of enjoyed watching. And I mean, as at least the first season of Discovery takes place 10 years before Captain Kirk, I'm thinking about it and I'm thinking about this evolution. And I'm thinking, well, maybe it's more so now that there is more of Burnham in Kirk. Right. Uh, and, you know, on that point, Matt, yeah. you know, Janeway makes a comment at one point that captains of that era were cut from a different cloth. They were much yes. quicker to draw their phasers first. Exactly. And in her time, they would all be cashiered out of Starfleet like that. But this yeah. was very, this time is very much the Wild West of the Alpha Quadrant. Absolutely. Yeah, and put that together with Captain Archer that was just way out there, you know. Yeah. Um, we get that, you know, the cowboy and, like, that transition. We're getting this Captain arc of Starfleet because, yeah, by the time we get Picard and Janeway, like, that is a different breed. Oh, my gosh, what a great, like, Burnham fills in between Archer and Kirk. Wow. Mm -hmm. There's very much a, there's very much a lineage and a process to each, to each captain. Um, and it is, yeah, it, it's so interesting to watch. And again, it's, it's very interesting to think that, okay, you know, well, technically, chronologically, Burnham came first. So Burnham's, you know, there's more Burnham in Kirk. Um, and I, I love that. And, you know, as we, we've watched her 
uh, grow into this captaincy, or as we've seen her, you know, become captain um, in, at the end of season three and then in season four, um, we see her kind of um, understand why she has the captain's chair and what she, you know, and the what's of what it means to be a captain throughout uh, throughout the fourth season, which I really enjoyed uh, enjoyed watching as well. I think that Michael Burnham is a good balance between uh, the shoot first, ask questions later, and the diplomacy. She can do both and follow both, uh, follow both to the extreme whenever necessary. And it's been a pleasure to watch that journey. I'm very excited to see what happens in season five. And I hope that we, I think we will get more discovery after se- after season five. I have a feeling. I just have a, a feeling we're going to see more of this crew. I'm I'm hoping is is, and I, I hate to be one of those people, but I'm overly not excited about Academy, because I like my Star Trek out in space. I like trekking. That's that's the point of Star Trek, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And I I feel like being landlocked at the Academy. I don't know. I'm I'm hopeful, but I'm also yeah. I, I have reservations. But one of the things that keeps me hopeful of okay, this is going to be in the same timeline of Discovery. And it, it's, and, and except for, you know, the TNG Voyager era, we've not had shows set in the same point in time together mm-hmm. running right, currently. Right. So with Discovery ending and Academy being in the same time, I'm hoping that's going to open the door for a lot of crossover between yeah. Discovery characters. You know, maybe yeah. Burnham's going to show up and with discovery and take the cadets on a training mission you know something like that that we can keep a rotation of these discovery characters in i'm really really especially because i think we already all know that tilly is crossing over to the academy show right right that's going to be the bridge between the two series yeah and you know i think what what's interesting as well is that you know we've had uh in regards to uh television shows star trek television shows that have been more stationary in their setting i mean deep space nine uh was also very much uh like that as well and you know i think we i mean i didn't have my reservations about it because i i don't know how old i was when uh, ds9 came out but you know i know that there was concern about ds9 just taking place on a station um and not being mobile and not moving but you know i think you know, I'm very curious to see what happens with Academy and with um, with where they're going to be able to go in mm. regards to, um, I mean, in regards to character journeys. But, you know, what shenanigans will they get into where they'll have to leave Earth? They'll have to go on a training mission on Discovery or some other starship. So, and, and Matt, you just laid it on a great point. Is the Academy going to take place on Earth or is it going to take place is the Academy integrated into that Federation headquarter bubble thing? Right. Where, right. you know, that's, that's a good point of view just because earth has rejoined the Federation is Starfleet going to relocate back to earth. I, that's v- very fascinating. Something I hadn't considered. Yeah. One of the things I love about discovery and the, the, the captaincy or the journey is I, I love sequence order collections and when you used to see things in the Berman era you'd always see Kirk Picard Cisco Janeway and then when Discovery came back they they never knew whose face to put on the lineup was was it the captain well we can't put Burnham because she's not the captain there's do so we'll put Lorca oh the new captains you've got Giorgio you've got Law ah oh, and it just really threw everything up into the mix whereas now we've had that journey that you can just put Burnham there to take her place in that long list. But the journey, what you said earlier, Matt, I think it's great. Everyone, if you remember when Voyager finished, Voyager got home and everyone said it would have been lovely to have a season eight to see what happened when they were at home. Whereas the journey to the chair, she's at the chair and we actually get to enjoy seeing her as a captain rather than just the final episode of discovery is you're now captain burnham so that's that's one of the things i i love and i'm doing a little bit of a rewatch as well like others are like getting ready for season five and seeing sonequa in command it, it is sort of lovely the way 
they brought her personality to it, a lot like Janeway did in the later seasons. Sonique was doing that straight away from being captain because we've seen that journey of her getting there, and I love it. You know, Kelvin, I, I, not all of us wanted that season eight of Voyager because as Voyager's biggest fan, I never wanted them to get home. I never wanted that. <laughs> I'm still I'm still angry that Voyager was take was ended where Voyager still could be on the air today as a general ra- generational Star Trek show mm-hmm. as the actors aged out and wanted to move on to other things those characters could have retired or died and we could have seen their descendants Voyager being a true generational ship and Voyager could still be out there in the Delta Quadrant there's no reason Voyager should have ever ended I'm going to die on that hill I am still very angry that my show ended Oh, but then we wouldn't get Prodigy. I know that. And I love Prodigy, but, you know, yeah. I want what I want. And my soul wanted Voyager to remain in the Delta Quadrant. Because <laughs> it was about the journey. It was about the family and not the destination. Right. It's what yeah. it was always about. Just well, listen, we have, we have some comments in the chat um, asking what is their favorite captains. And we have, hi, William Jackson. Howdy, Trekkies. Favorite disco captain is Burnham, hands down. However, I loathe that we may never see Prime Universe, Good Giorgio, or Prime Lorca. It's a shame. Yeah. And well, Giorgio, we did see, but and she got eaten by Klingon. So we did get to see her. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Rashid. Hi, guys. My favorite captain, Burnham, but I absolutely love Captain Giorgio. Wish we saw more of her, definitely. I love that we're getting so much love for Captain Burnham quite often, yes. especially in you know in the Twitter Twitter space as Treky Twitter people are sometimes a little bit mean about you know, Burnham. So I'm loving to the get love. on my to get on my soapbox here one more time. Anybody that hates Discovery, hates on Discovery or Burnham. All I have to say is is that you should be thankful for Discovery and everything that Discovery has done for the franchise, because without Discovery, we would have gotten nothing else of the second golden era of Star Trek. Yeah. We owe all of it to Discovery. Yeah. Like, love, it or, love it or hate it, we owe yeah. everything to Discovery. Exactly. And, and, it was obviously, in the modern era. and it was obviously a success, or we would have gotten nothing that came after. Yeah. Well said. Amy, where can we see more of a discussion on the captains of Discovery? What we listen, strange new pod, go over to their YouTube. They have a very in depth, I mean, we're just a little, you know, talk show segment here, in depth discussion of those captains over on the strange new pod YouTube channel. So go check them out. Great. Wonderful. Jeremiah, thank you so much for coming on the view screen with that really comprehensive presentation. Uh, We will see you guys a little later in the show. Yes. Right. Okay. Wow, we've got through so much already, Amy, and we've still got to get back to the kitchen yet. So let's take a, a little break. What else can you listen to on the BQN? Replicate yourself a mug of hot chocolate and join Amy, Mark, Christos, and Kelvin as they discuss everything and anything in the Star Trek universe on All Good Things. Boost yourself with an energy drink and join Davey on YouTube and Twitch for reviews and live streams of classic, cheap, and sometimes more recent video games on Bargain Bin Gamer. Brew yourself a pot of coffee and join Jeremiah to discuss Star Trek Voyager on The Captain's Couch. Mix your favorite cocktail and join Mark and Matt at Cinema Z to discuss the films you probably missed but should definitely check out. Pour a cup of tea, Earl Grey hot and listen to Stephen and Keith as they discuss the next generation of Trek on Galaxy Class. Get yourself something caffeinated and learn an interesting bit of history with Chrissy and Jason on History with the Zaloggies. Have a bowl of Plomeek soup and join Thad and Chrissy and a guest to discuss new episodes of Star Trek as they are released on Infinite Diversity. Have something to sharpen your mind and put your Trek knowledge to the test with the Trexperts quiz. Take a bite out of something that didn't seem edible and join Kyle, Kevin, Amy, and Haley covering all things in New Trek, including that show that is Trek in all but name, The Orville, on Union Federation. Get your Sunday brunch ready for The View Screen, a live weekly talk show hosted by Kelvin and Amy with featured guests talking about all things Trek. 
Pour a glass of wine and spill some tea with Priestess, where we discuss his current Trek news and events and explores the world of fandom via guest interviews, all with an LGBTQIA perspective on What's the Tea, Bev? And Patreon members get to pass around that green bottle of Aldebaran whiskey once a month on the round table, and they can listen to It's Green with Mark White and Amy's Math Moments. Well, I hope you recognize some of today's guests from that little promo clip that we have there. Let's uh, head over to the kitchen and see how uh, Matthew's balls are coming on. <laughs> All right. So it's been about 30 minutes. So the meat mixture has sort of firmed up a little bit. And just like in the first segment where I mentioned uh, the key technique, which is don't overmix the mixture, you don't want to overform or over manhandle your balls, I suppose I could say. So just really quick, sort of gently get them in ball form and you're good to go. So this mixture should make about 20. So what I like to do is, this is not pretty, but it's hard to sort of know what size should it be. So just divide it in half with your hand, sort of like that. And then you know that you wanna make 10 from this half and 10 from that half. So that's sort of the cheat that I do. You're gonna use that? Well, oh. do you? Oh no, I'm no? just gonna eyeball it. So just, oh. just kind of grab a little pinch quickly roll okay i'm really surprised and you're because done. you are so like it's you don't weigh out the meatballs because no. you love the no. scale i know or I do. you don't use no, a sure scoop don't. i sure don't to make them uniform size just grab a pinch interesting roll for just a couple of seconds again you don't want it to be too dense but enough that it's ball like and you're done is that that's yeah that's fine a little small but you know oh. we all have different preferences okay so we go like that. Now, I'm not going to sit here and make 20 balls uh, while y'all are watching. So here is where the, the crotta glaze comes in. Uh, and then uh, I'll make the rest of the 20 uh, off air. But then you just sort of gently paint it with this little kind of brush thingy. I don't know the formal name. Then we're going to pop it in a 375 degree oven for 20 minutes. And then we'll come back and we'll taste them and we'll see how they turn out. All right. Wow, thank you, Matt. I can't wait to see that. Amy, get yourself back over while we... All right, I'm gonna wash yeah, my yeah. hands. Well done. Public health message announcement. Well done, Amy. You get yourself back over here while we carry on with the show and introduce our next guest. We would like to welcome to the stage, uh, Matt Jennings, all the way from Cinema Z. Matt. Hello, hello. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the view screen. Thank you for having me on your view screen. It's nice to be viewed and screened. <laughs> Why don't, don't you tell the means. viewers a little bit about Cinema Z? What have you guys been up to recently? Uh, so we, uh, what we do at Cinema Z is we, um, we're a film discussion panel. It's me, it's uh, Mark, and it is uh, Davey Ryan who does... Uh, Trek spurts. Quiz. Uh, and so what we uh, what we do is we discuss films, we showcase films that you probably missed out, but should definitely check out from the independent and obscure to art house and absurd. That's also our introduction to every episode. <clears throat> so uh, I think we, we've recorded a few in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we did Dead Man. Uh, we reviewed Dead Man uh, back in January. We re we reviewed The Matrix, which is my favorite. With Please. your dad. With that was dad. so fun. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, and that one is out. So definitely please go ahead and take a listen, uh, a listen to that one. Uh, but yeah, that's what we do with, Cine uh, with Cinema Z. That's what we, and the most recent one is Three Idiots. And that's with me. <laughs> yes. And that was also very fun. And uh, that was a I good discussion. That's the name of the film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> But, you know, it was Mark, Matt, and me. That's three idiots. <laughs> yeah, it, it fits. It fits. So, Matt, with you being such an expert on all things cinemagraphic, what are your thoughts on Star Trek Discovery and how it fits into kind of the big production styles that you get in movies? Well, it's very interesting because, I mean, what, what we saw uh, after... After Star Trek Nemesis, and then we, you know, we jumped to the next movie, what, five years? No, wait, 2002 to 2009. So like seven years down the road, we jumped to um, the J.J. Abrams verse, the 2009 mm -hmm. Star Trek movie. And 
I think up to date at that point, that was like the most, that was the biggest budget, the, the Star Trek film with the biggest budget. And so there's just a different flavor in, uh, in cinematography and storytelling. Um, and you can see that influence in Star Trek Discovery as well. And I think that, you know, that's also testament to just, I guess, Alex Kurtzman, who was also one of the producers in uh, the Abrams films, at least maybe the first two, I think, because he hops on to uh, to helm, you know, the rebirth of Star Trek in 2017 with Discovery. And you can see just the the cinematic influence with, um, I guess, for one, what do they call them? Uh, like Dutch angle shots. So you Ooh. see, you know, the shot is like not quite, it's not quite on level. I know my camera, my camera is kind of like at a Dutch angle right now. I'm not quite, you know. <laughs> Um, so, you know, you've got starships, you know, coming in out of warp like this. Um, and actually, you know, I've got a, I have slides. There are slides that I have. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, you see there's, uh, there's a shot of it and they started doing it with, um, with the, the 2009 Star Trek movie, uh, the first JJ Abrams movie where you can see, uh, the Enterprise approaching the uh, the Narada. Oh, I didn't put them in order. Uh, those. Are oh no, no, first. no. Okay, but... my bad, my bad, my bad. No, it's okay. Okay, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, there's um, but there's a shot you can see of um of the Enterprise approaching the Narada, but it's it's upside down, uh, approaching the Narada. I think the the Narada is the ship that's level in the shot. The Enterprise is approaching upside down. Um, and is it that one? Uh. It's the other one. Okay, hold Not on. That one. Is it there that it one? is. Okay. So <laughs> we worked it out. Um, yeah, you can see the Enterprise coming in at this, you know, upside down angle. And you've got the Narada that's, I think at that point, still pretty, uh, pretty level. And then you see, at least in my opinion, you see the shots kind of duplicated in Discovery. Uh, where you've got, um, for one, the bridge of the Shenzhou is mm. at the bottom, uh, is at the bottom of the, of the saucer section instead of being on the top. But, you know, you've got a shot of the Shenzhou, you know, coming in and, you know, the camera pans in to, uh, to the bridge. And that's another thing too, in terms of just the aesthetic of uh, the JJ Abrams films, the starships uh, and the discovery, the discovery era ships, you know, all the view screens have windows now. And I think I think that's something that we just carried throughout all of the newer newer uh, Star Trek shows, which, you know, it's cool. It's totally fine with me. Um, but, you know, we see a lot of that, a lot of that influence. We see lens flares, obviously. Lens flares are very big. J.J. Uh, Abrams thing that you know it's just it's just part of uh part of the aesthetic now you know we've got that shot in 2009 star trek with uh kirk and uh kirk and spock um and there's another shot here i think this was a promo shot this wasn't a production shot from discovery but you know you see the lens flare influence still uh reverberating to this new era of star trek that's there we go <sighs> Um, that's that's coming about. So, you know, I think as we, you know, as we talk about Discovery and how, you know, Discovery is responsible for this rebirth of Trek and all these new, um, uh, all these new Star Trek shows. What was that? I wish we'd seen the positioning of the bridge on the bottom. I Yeah, I think that's very interesting. Also from a tactical advantage to have the bridge at the bottom of the saucer section. And, yeah, and wouldn't it be topics. more protected? <laughs> it would, it would be much more protected. Um, but, but yeah, you can see the, the J.J. Abrams influence just kind of reverberate and reverberate and reverberate throughout each show, uh, even down to, um, and I know this isn't necessarily the cinematography, but the, the makeup design for the Klingons as well. Um, I think in Star Trek Into Darkness, the Klingons were, uh, a little closer to what we've what we've seen in 90s Trek. But there was a proposed design. Uh, I think this was an earlier design. What you're looking at right now is an early design proposed 
for maybe Star Trek 2009. It may have also been a proposed design for Into Darkness. But either way, you know, the Klingons were were bald. Their heads were, I guess their heads were more or less shaved. And that design definitely carried over into uh, into at least the first season of Discovery. I think the Klingons got their hair back in the... Um, in the second season as I guess they were no longer at war. So it's like, Hey, you know, let me go to the salon. Let me get my press, you know, let me get my silk press. Let me get my perm, you know, I'm ready to go. Let's go back to work. Um, so it's just, you know, we see the reverberation of the JJ Abrams influence throughout, uh, throughout that first season of discovery. I think it kind of uh, toned down. I want to say in that third season, like the action influence is still there, uh, but I think that I don't I don't see any more Dutch angle shots in Discovery now. Um, it's more it's more Star Trek of I think what we were of what we were used to, and you know and that is no disrespect to um, and I want to give uh, these cinematographers their uh, their due and their credits, and I wrote down their names here. Um, you know with uh, the cinematography for the two, 2009 J.J. Abrams, Abrams film, Dan Mendel, uh, mm. obviously beautiful work. And uh, for uh, my references for uh, the Discovery, uh, the first episode of Discovery, uh, season one, episode one, Balkan Hello, uh, Guillermo Navarro, beautiful work. Um, again, you know, I think that this kind of helped us to just carry things on and, you know, give us an aesthetic that was stimulating to I think a new audience as well because you know we need that new audience for Trek to keep uh to keep going you know I think we need a little bit of the old and a little bit of the new and you know mm -hmm. I think that you know since we're talking about you know evolution in regards to the evolution of you know the captaincy and what was the right stuff to become a captain I think overall with Trek in this new era, you know, we had the Abrams influence in Discovery. Um, I think we had a little bit of it in Picard as well. Uh, obviously, Lower Decks was a whole different animal prodigy. Uh, I think we see more of that as well, especially in the, the music choice uh, in, in Prodigy. There's a lot of, to me, some J.J. Abrams uh, Trek music in that but i think strange new worlds is the final step at least right now in that evolution i think of the new and a little bit of a flavor of uh of the old in terms of storytelling uh i think strange new worlds is more of the 90s 60s style of storytelling of mm -hmm. discussing you know the theme of the day um and just the visual aesthetic is more uh is more updated but I know it went a little off on topic. I guess I'm just thinking about it all as a whole. But, <laughs> you know, um, really Discovery and, you know, the J.J. Abrams, the, the influence of that design, it reverberated. But I think we needed that extra piece to push us, uh, to push us forward into where we are today. You know, I had never thought about it connecting to the J.J. Abrams films. And you're exactly right. And I've always wondered, like, why is Discovery like so much like a movie? Um, and it's getting those influences from the movies. Like, I get Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. it's you know, and that's just I think just also a testament to what's happening now in regards to um, television shows and and movie world, that line in production quality uh, between someone being able to look at a TV show and go, oh, that's a TV episode, or someone being able to look at a movie and say, oh, this is clearly a movie budget, that line is gone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's it's well, absolutely gone. You know. Let's let's bring in uh, Matthew and Jeremiah as well while we reflect on this too. Amy, you've got a question? Yes, I do have a question, I guess, to everyone. So... Discovery is a TV show. So when I'm watching it and I've noticed that there's a lot of times if I'm watching during the day, especially when it's, you know, coming out in the summertime and here in Las Vegas, we have sunshine. I can't get, okay. I don't have a theater room. 
And it's so dark. dark. And I get why it is for a movie because you that is made to be seen in a dark room in a movie theater. Do you feel that it's appropriate for Discovery to be having so much darkness in the episodes? It's made for TV. Well, I, I'll, I'll take this one first, Amy. I, I think, you know, we've got to look at it, not only how it's cinematically filmed, but also mod how modern TVs are, which they are just, they're basically now smaller versions of a theatrical screen with mm -hmm. the formatting and the, the picture technology. Um, as far as the Too Much Light in Las Vegas, I highly recommend room darkening blinds and heavy drapes that black out the light which I have throughout my entire house. So there's very little natural light in here. So on a 75 inch TV, it is still very much a cinematic experience, at least from my, my point of view, which makes it very highly enjoyable. Um, right. And it's not I, enjoyable when it's not dark. That's just what I'm saying. Right. Right. So I'm recommending like, you know, getting, you know, uh, light dampening, Drapes and room. Oh, so blocks. you're just saying get over it, Nelson. I, yeah. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just, I'm just trying to help you enjoy it. Enjoy it. Yeah, to the no. best possible. I don't have this problem in the UK. We don't get oh. sunshine. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it's definitely a problem here. We shouldn't have to buy curtains to watch TV and right. to not talk about the other universe too much. I've been binging Star Wars The Bad Batch recently, which is a cartoon, but it's third season. It's a freaking cart. I can't see anything. And it's a cartoon. It's so dark. And it's like, this is a pervasive problem. I think go on Twitter, anything that talks about TV shows or movies. Um, yeah, Picard season three was dark. TV is just dark because I think these producers are watching it, like screening the episodes on like mm -hmm. the fanciest of fancy stuff, uh, which we don't have at home. They need to watch it on home TVs, whether you have the newest thing. I just want to see what's happening on the screen. I, will, I think that's absolutely um, right. I've got to say, Amy, in regards to Discovery being so dark, that first season was was very dark. And I remember my, you know, my little nerd heart, my frustration was that it took me a good, I don't know, maybe five episodes to know what the USS Discovery looked like in total. Yes. Yeah. I was like, what does it look like? I don't yeah. understand. The first season's also really blue yes. in space. And it's mm -hmm. hard to make out the Discovery with all that blue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the You're... things I, I did, sorry, Amy, no. um, how I bought the, the the two TVs I've owned as an adult is the first time when I bought my plasma TV, I took my DVD player and disc disc uh, one of season four of Voyager to the store with me hmm. and made them hook it up. And I bought the TV that Scorpion part two looked the best on. <laughs> That's a good idea. I did wow. the same thing with my new my new 75 inch TV again. Bought the TV that Scorpion Part 2 looked the best on because it's very heavily 90s television CGI. So I That's bought the TV based idea. on how it absolutely looked. Then when I get it home, I played with the settings and I have a custom uh, setting for the picture quality that's called Voyager. And it may it is how the entire series <laughs> looks the of best. <laughs> wow, that I've, is a really good hint. A tip. I've, yeah. also, I've also noticed by applying that setting to all Trek helps kind of curb some of that darker aspect of the modern Trek. Wow. A lot of people have complained about it. I'm like, I don't have that issue. Like, I think it looks phenomenal. Then I remember, oh, I made a custom setting specifically for voyager but happens wow. to also really work well with all series so mm. jeremiah you might need to share those settings uh over on our facebook group or on our discord because yeah. i would I will be interested in. to get those <laughs> i will see what i can do all i do right. remember at the time when picard season three came out i'm sure there was some problem where on one of the platforms it was or in one of the regions it was transmitted and it was super dark. It was darker than intended. And mm. Paramount had to take down the episodes and almost repurpose them. Uh, and it, it was around the kind of the no win scenario episode, like episode four. I remember mm. a lot of chat online. What I noticed about the, the kind of cinematography or the difference in the style of discovery was that because there was no soft furnishings or soft surfaces, even the sound was very echoey. If you think of the comm chimes 
that you hear inside of Discovery. They're very echoey, like they bounce off all of this hard surface, which has become such a kind of a, a, a character of the series that when they carried that through into Picard um, for Rios' ship, that they almost had to make the joke about the carpets on the Enterprise D to kind of say, this is this is the old Berman era ships. Mm-hmm. Well, it's very interesting in the beginning, you know, it's that, um, I think that just that J.J. Abrams aesthetic and also I think just, you know, the Hollywood, <clears throat> the Hollywood idea of just bigger, we have to go bigger. Mm-hmm. So I think even with the sounds that, you know, that echo trying to fill the ship, um, it's just, we've seen, we've seen that continue. I think they've dialed it back uh, with season three of Picard, just thinking about, uh, the the Enterprise G, formerly you know the Titan, uh, which is now a smaller a smaller starship. Uh, I think the bridge is still very large, but um, you know it's a smaller starship. And you know, in comparison to the Enterprise F that came before that, which was yeah, what, two monster. times bigger than the Enterprise mm. E. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, you know, and I also think Strange New Worlds, even though it is still big, the bridge is very much. It's about the size it would have been in in TOS or as, you know, the bridge of a starship would have been in the next generation. So, like, I think we're we're slowly but surely getting back to, you know, you know, they always seem seem really cold as well. The the new era ships. Amy, I think you would be freezing all the time (laughs) if you were on one of those starships. You'd you'd be reaching for your jacket. No. Well, thankfully, Star Trek uniforms are pretty warm, as you all tell me as you're walking nice. around STLV. <laughs> it's too warm. <laughs> you know, um, William brings up a good point. Uh, views of the outer space on Discovery are a dream come true. Gorgeous. Like those visuals, the nebulas and the I just watched uh, the one where they had to go into Talos 4 in season two mm-hmm. rewatch oh, and just yeah. it was so beautiful like the spatial anomalies are gorgeous yeah There's and even extend part. that a little bit to kind of planet scenes as well how much mm-hmm. you know did the planet hell stage 16 uh get used and we we joke about it now but in the now modern days of things like the ar walls Everything is yeah. so rich. So, I mean, Matt, what what's been your perception of the use of this emerging technology in Star Trek? Um, you know, I think I think the AR wall it's it's very much like our modern day, you know, digital backdrop. Um, and I think while it's great for it to be used, I am assuming it's a money saver as well. Mm. Um, there is still something that can't be duplicated when uh, when you don't have real real effects, wow. real yeah. stuff. Tangible. Um, yeah. yeah. And I mean, and, and look, you know, I don't work in that in that side of production, so you know, I'm not going to say, oh, you should, you know, I want yeah. to touch the leaves. I want it, you know, because. You know, only God knows what, you know, how much time you have to put stuff together. You got to, you know, so, but I do have to say, you know, there's something about being able to, to really see it up close uh, and know that it's not a, uh, a generated image that is very special. I think those things hold the test of time. And maybe in this area of AR walls, maybe it's more just a marriage of practical and digital really working together. I think that's when effects uh, hold the test, stand the test of time. Um, <clears throat> I think about, you know, first contact, start to first contact, that shot of the uh, of the Borg queen mm-hmm. coming down and descending into her, into her suit, which I heard, I heard take months, I think months to, uh, to, to finish to do, but that effect to this day, that was 96. 96. Yeah. Um, and you know what? It's 2024. It looks amazing. It still looks good. It holds up. So I do believe that they actually won the Academy Award for that too. Mm-hmm. Rightfully, I, so. I can't remember. I can't remember if they were just nominated or if they actually won. Either way, for Star Trek to get that kind of recognition, 
you know, rightfully so. I mean, I, I love, I love building model kits. Personally, a little thing about me. I love, love, love building model kits. I did it during the pandemic a whole lot um, just to keep me sane and to pass the time. And, you know, I love the, the studio models that we got to see that were used, you know, during the, the early TNG movies and um, all of the TOS movies. I mean, that's also a, a tedious chore, you know, within itself. I think Seth MacFarlane uh, kept it alive for a little bit when he did the first season of Orville. Um, he used uh, studio models for, for the Orville. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's something just special about about knowing that models. work, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, I think, look, you know, you, I think just marry the two together. Yeah, and I think you know you'll you'll stand the test of time with your work. Wonderful. I hate to bring up Star Wars again, but I read an article about the Acolyte, <laughs> which is the new show coming out. Yeah, and all the other shows have been using their version of the AR wall, and the Acolytes we're not going to use that. They're going back to practical, which I think Ooh. is really interesting. Assuming yeah. I understood that article I read correctly. Uh, well, you but know, I wonder if Star Trek might be like you know maybe we do need to go back. I think I they might. will. I mean, you know, J.J. Abrams kind of did it. Uh, as well, I mean, he did it with two thousand, uh, with two thousand nine. Uh, like there were, I think, some tricks that he did with uh, the two thousand nine film. Can't remember specifically what they were, but to save to save money. But I think it was practical uh, practical effects that he used. Uh, if we look at um, Star Trek, the Star Trek Star Wars: The Force Awakens, um, in comparison to uh, Star Wars: Revenge of the Sith you can see that there was a very big uh, reversal and return to practical mm -hmm. effects. I mean, obviously CG as well, but um, there was more practical effects in Star Wars. Like all those worlds in uh, The Force Awakens were, were built mm. um, and tangible, whereas in, um, uh, in Revenge of the Sith, it was all, it was all green screen. Yeah. And so I think, you know, I guess thinking about J.J. Abrams and his influence, again, you know, it's it's that return to practical that really adds something special to it. Wonderful. To uh, completely jump genres for a second, I, I love the practical. I think that there's nothing more beautiful than a physical ship model myself. Yeah. Um, but on the this upcoming Beetlejuice sequel, Tim Burton has said that the effects are practical, including using stop motion animation, which we all know I'm a huge fan oh. of like the original Beetlejuice did. So it's practical. It's got the stop motion that the original yeah. was known for, which has just really upped my excitement about it. Is there's you just cannot beat the feel of those tangible you can. effects. You yeah. Can. And Wonderful. what I love sometimes you sorry, go ahead. What were you No, go on Matt, you do finish off. I know I was gonna say, you know, what I love sometimes too, um with certain uh cinematographers, film directors if they want to have the film have like an older tone and older style, I've heard that some uh, sometimes they'll purposefully put like the dots or flickers, you know, in the, the little uh, grain, little grains, yeah, add yeah. some grain to. I I love it. I love it. Yeah. I think it's. I think it's. A nice I've done style. that in some of my own animation. Wanted it to look grainy, like it was on thirty-five millimeter film. Yeah. Oh. Nice. Wow. Well, okay. Matt, thank you for reminding us how beautiful Discovery is. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I don't know if anyone else can smell burning. So maybe we should uh, head back <laughs> over to the kitchen there. I can see some stuff's come out of the oven. So Matt, Jeremiah, thank you so much. Uh, and let's check in with Matthew over in the kitchen. Amy, you better get yourself over there. So how's it looking, Matt? Uh, it's looking good. They just came out of the oven. Oh my gosh, you guys, it smells so good in my house. Uh, I wish we had smell a vision. Yeah. That's <laughs> so good. So now I'm going to reglaze with a separated out Prada sauce. This is not the one where the raw meat Touched. thing went in. So I, I did split it in two. I know food safety yeah, matters. Yeah. I don't want to give you food poisoning. <laughs> Thank you. But I just got to do one final little baste here and then we're ready to taste. Oh my gosh, they look so good. Yeah. You want to grab the plate yes. for us? Please. So I take it, I mean, if, if people don't eat meat, you could substitute this out with vegetarian meatballs or falafels or something, maybe. 
I would assume so. Uh, I've not really experimented a lot with the plant-based meats. I, like I've eaten them at restaurants, yeah. But in terms of me cooking with it, I I don't have any experience. I bet it would be great because those meats are, or you know, plant-based meats. They're really good to hold stuff. And I bet I don't know tofu. Or I don't know. I'm not sure. You know, obviously you have to find a substitute for the anchovies, which is adding umami. But there are things you can use uh, or just leave it out, honestly. Yeah. Um, in this case, because these are not beef, I meant to mention this earlier, because these are not beef meatballs, which would have more of a, a beefy flavor. Um, I think I'm that's the role that the and... anchovies are trying to Oh, accomplish. look at those. There yeah. we go. And let's... Uh... So how do you serve this up, Matthew? I'm just going to, well, no, you wouldn't really eat this as a, by itself. It's like an appetizer. Yeah. Right, okay. To put it on your buffet board. On right, buffet so maybe board. like with a bit of salad, any kind of dip, or is the, the glaze enough of a sauce? I think the glaze is enough, and there's extra if you want to dip in there. Uh, the book says uh, it pairs well with Klingon blood wine. Nice. And uh, fried potatoes or a fried dough. So Excellent. I'm not sure I would have selected. There, is there a photograph of the dish in the book? There is. And I'm just see. wondering if we can hold it up against your own. So just we can see what a great job you've done. So that's oh, the official. Me. Yes. Let's see, Amy. Don't tip them off the plate. Sort of... Look at that. Well done. Well done. <laughs> Now, I guess the only thing left to do now is the bit is the exciting bit, certainly for you, Amy. How did yeah. it taste? Mm. I think definitely the not over mixing and the not compressing the balls. They're... Don't compress your balls, people. Yeah, it's very light. These are way better than anything you could get. Oh, my gosh. And the flavor. What do you think of the. Can you taste the anchovy? Because I cut back from what the rest yeah. of the is it for. fishy tasting? Slight. I I don't no. know that I would do much more actually. I don't know that in this because again the recipe calls for two ounces. Last night I recipe tested with one ounce. This is about 0. 0.6 ounces of anchovies. I don't know that I would know what's in it. Right. You would just know it tastes meaty. Well, and I might if we were to do something different, make it. A little more spicy, like sriracha, maybe. I actually put more sriracha than the recipe called for. I agree, it needs. Yeah, more. a little more heat. Yeah. Right. So oh I mean, I'm I'm just sat here watching you eat. So let's level the playing field a little. Let's bring Matt and Jeremiah in. And Matthew, why don't you uh, remind the viewers of your source material? Show us the book again. Who's the author? Where, which is the book? Because there's a few Star Trek cookbooks around. This That's is right. This is the newest published one, the Star Trek cookbook uh, by New York Times bestselling author uh, Chelsea Monroe Castle. Uh, so you should be able to still find this in bookstores or yeah. any online book retailer because it's the newest uh, book that there is. It's a really good one. I got given it for Christmas. There's lots of cocktails in there as well uh, for those of you who just like a drink like me. <laughs> so, um, Jeremiah, have you ever made anything from the Cooking with Neelix book that did the rounds a few years ago? I'm wondering. If you I, I have not. I want to. I actually have two copies. I have one that is pristine that I won't bend the spine on and keep it in the, the, the Trek book archive. Um, and mm. I do have a a, ver a not so pristine version I found secondhand that's in the kitchen for the you specifically to use. However, I haven't had the occasion to use it because I only enjoy cooking when I'm cooking for others. I hate cooking for myself. Like to, I would rather I would I will spend a stupid amount of money just getting food to go um, to to keep myself fueled rather than go into the kitchen and cook. I loathe it unless yeah. I'm having. I'm cooking for other people. So I, I know like an occasion. Yeah. Because yeah. none of the people that I and you guys are, you know, the ones that I would want to do that for. And we all live so far apart. Yeah. yeah. It'd be cold by the time I got there. Yeah, it would. <laughs> <We're, laughs> one of the, the things I want to say about the, the Neelix book has, in my opinion, the better recipe for Hasperat. Where I do know the new book has a Hasperat recipe, but I prefer the old one. So that's my little Majoran preference you know, there. 
you can also just take anything and uh, make it Star Trek themed for food. Make it blue. Not to make right. <laughs> I have. <laughs> I was experimenting with um, some chicken and some Italian seasoning and um, some other things that I found and called it Romulan Vulture. You know, because it's like, got the <laughs> Rom- You know, it's part of their 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 icon. You know, the the Romulan yeah. Vulture with Romulus and Remus in it. And I was like, yeah. it looked kind of weird once it was done, and it had kind of this very interesting flavor and i'm like let's make it a romulan dish nice and what about yourself matt do you make any star trek snacks while you're watching all your films oh girl okay so here's the story um so i i believe it's from the neil's cookbook which i uh, which i do have it was a gift from my friend uh, my friend amanda and i was trying to make i um, was going to surprise my uh my boyfriend at the time with a uh with, uh, I think it was jambalaya because uh, mm. I was looking up different dishes and I was trying to find something easy to make and I thought this will be easy and quick to make I was so wrong um, and I did not read the whole uh, mm. I didn't read all the directions and at the very end of it it said this is not an easy dish, dish to make or <laughs> this is not <laughs> it even told you <laughs> it even told me and I just did not read the whole thing um so that was that was quite an experience i will return i will return to that book after i've gotten over my trauma and healed from my my wounds and my humiliation uh, Matt, i uh, i did something very similar there was a shrimp recipe i wanted to make and uh-huh. i knew that it took 24 hours of prep time and decided oh i can gosh. do this in two hours <laughs> and uh, oh, no. by not do, following the 24 hours prep, the batter wouldn't stick to the shrimp, obviously, and it just disintegrated in the fryer. But oh, the worst geez. part was, is it requires flat beer, right? Oh, well, I, okay. I decided, oh, I'll just throw the beer in the blender and get it oh. to go flat by spinning it around. And this is my, you know, nice high dollar ninja with the locking lid. Oh, no. And it Boom. blew the lid off, destroyed the blender because it broke the locking mechanism uh, and sprayed beer all over my kitchen. Wow. Don't try this at home, people. Yeah. Exactly. Follow follow the prep instructions. If it says 24 hours, it's going to be 24 hours. I have got a quote from Captain Cisco as well regarding, well, I guess from Captain Cisco's dad, technically, regarding cooking. Uh, Worry and doubt are the greatest enemies of a great chef. The souffle will either rise or it won't. There's not a damn thing you can do about it. I love that. And what a great impression as well of Joseph. Well done, Matt. Well, <laughs> Matthew, I, I can, your balls are getting cold. So getting I cold. Oh, we you don't like enjoy cold balls. your dinner. Uh, I bet Amy's <laughs> got some <laughs> wine that you can recommend to go with it. I'm sorry, what was that last question? I said, I bet Amy's got a fantastic wine recommendation of what she can pair with it. Uh, Amy likes her wine. But Amy, you better get yourself back over here. You've got a job to do. Uh, So, guys, thank you very much for coming onto the view screen. You enjoy your dinner, uh, Matthew, uh, Matt, uh, Jeremiah. We'll see you a little bit later. Right. Are you back with us, Amy? Are you all plugged in? (laughs) Uh, here we are. Oh, <laughs> well, just a special thank you to our amazing hosts who came on again. Matthew has the food replicator. So go check that out. It's on YouTube. We've got the link in the show notes. Um, and he does put it out as a podcast. So you can either watch him on YouTube or listen to the audio. And we have Captain Jeremiah of Captain's Couch. Coming soon to you, some Voyager discussions. And of course, Matt with Cinema Z talking all things films. It's really interesting to one, see what films they do choose and then to hear them talk about it. And I've listened to their podcast even before watching the movie. And I'm like, that was a great discussion. And I went and watched the movie and it was wonderful to do it that way or watch the movie first, and then listen to the discussion. It works both ways, surprisingly. 
Wonderful. Amazing. Amazing. Well, we would love to hear what you thought of today's bonus Encore episode, and we hope that you'll join our Facebook group, the BQN Collective, to continue the discussion there. Or you can head over to our Discord channel uh, and uh, pick up on the chat over there. You can find the invite code for Discord in the show notes underneath. Yes. Yes. And a special thanks to our strange new pod. What a great group they are over there for letting us to participate and open up their last days of Disco Festival. Uh, we look forward to many more future collaborations. This has been really fun. Yeah, big thank you to Giraffe uh, MC and the team over at Strange New Pod for inviting us to put this special episode on for them. Yes. But with it being our uh, final episode, Amy, I think, is there anybody else we need to thank as, as well as our loyal viewers? Yes, a huge thank you to our current Patreon members who we would like to name out individually. And that is Jason Anderson. Jerry Antamano. Vera Bible. Susan Capuzzi de Clerc. Jim Cooper. David. Chrissy de Clerc Delaghi. Lars Desenza. Thad Haight. Matt Harker. Peter Hong. Shalomar Lewis. Jim McMahon. Joe Migoni. Mahendran Radhakrishnan. Tom Van Scooter. Jonathan Snow, Riker Tattoo, Davey Willett, and Carl Wonders. And if you would like to support us or the network, please go to patreon.com slash BQN. And don't forget to like us and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you won't miss our upcoming season two starting in September. So September may seem a long time away. So that is the view screen done. However, as we said last week, Amy and I will be heading back over to All Good Things, which starts recording in a couple of weeks' time. And we're hoping to drop our first episode of the new season on wherever you get your podcasts around First Contact Day. So yeah. that kind of first couple of weeks of April. But in the meantime, Amy, thank you yeah. as always. Thank you. It's time to end transmission. Have a great day. Bye.